Go ahead. Hi, James. This is Reen, and I'll be your moderator. Fantastic. Hello, Mr. Reen. I feel honored to have such a high-profile moderator. Oh, wow. No, it's the honor is entirely mine. Hi, Gino. You, uh, you, you really love the office hours, right? Yeah, but these feel like the most social, the closest to the <laughs> web day. <laughs> right, oh, yeah. I like to come in and have my video on. If it's too distracting, I'll shut it off, but it's, you know. <laughs> That's nice, really nice. And I would encourage everyone who has a question to uh, turn on their camera um, and you can unmute yourself or you can use the Whova ses session Q&A, which I will be monitoring if you want to type your question. So, and with that, um, is there anyone who wants to raise a first question? Uh oh. Ah, Matthew, <laughs> go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. I typed it out. Um, so, James, uh, what would be the starting point to um, write a subscription queue manager in the Happy Fire JPA server? Ooh, that's a fun one. So subscription, I'm assuming what you're talking about there is um, you're looking for, yeah, so I, I guess I'll start at the start here. The way that uh, the way that happy out of the box works is any any subscription processing. And that, of course, most importantly includes stuff that has been enqueued for delivery, but has not yet been delivered. Um, is stuck into an in-memory queue, which is awesome for testing um, and is very fast, but has lots of limitations. Uh, certainly in terms of scalability and reliability and that type of thing. I'm assuming that's that's the heart of your question there? Yes, cool. it is. Okay, so the deal there, um, all of this stuff is wired together using a library called Spring Integration. Uh, Spring Integration is, um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm in love with the Spring framework in general. Um, and we use lots of parts of it in, uh, in Happy Fire. Subscription, um, all of the subscription pipeline is all built on top of spring integration and we're using what they call a i'm forgetting its name but it's, it's like a linked blocking queue channel uh, everything in, in spring integration is channels so the default implementation you'll notice is this linked blocking queue channel um, i'm pretty sure that's its name uh, and really what you're looking there to to do is replace that with any of any other of springs um, built-in channel implementations and there are a ton of them they've got rabbit mq and kafka and jms and uh, there's, I think they've even, there's one I found once that just literally sort of dumped things to file system without even needing any, uh, any third party software. So there's a bunch of really good ones uh, there. So that, I mean, effectively, that's what you're doing is as long as you can sort of wrap your head around spring integration, it's, it's not the, the most trivial library to sort of get going, but it's not, it's not totally rocket science either. Okay, um, good. That's kind of the keystone I was looking for. Right. Um, I guess, I mean, the one thing I'll add there, I suspect some of this is going to change. It's fun that we've got Gino in the room. He's leading a, a charge to revamp the way subscriptions in general work in Fire. Um, the way that everything in Happy works today is around this concept of two types of queues, one that we call the matching queue, which is used for subscription matching, and a second one, which is, is delivery, and that's stuff that's been in queued, of course, to get delivered. I'm suspecting we're going to end up sort of re-architecting that out into a number of, of topic-specific queues as well, given the, uh, the new subscription architecture that's coming along. We've, we've started playing with it, but not gotten too serious. So some of this may change a bit, but fundamentally, it'll still be channels in spring, spring uh, integration. Okay, cool. Thanks. James, I have a question here. Or rather, it's not a question. It's someone offering to help a fire imp implementer from Brazil. I was wondering if you're still looking for volunteers to collaborate with the Happy Project. And maybe you can talk a little bit about how to contribute up to Happy in general. Oh, I love it. Um, and it occurs to me, I, I feel like I got a message from someone in Brazil about this right as the pandemic was hitting here. And I think in our shuffle to get out of the office, I may have not replied to that email. Um, if, the, if the person asking is that person, I am sorry I didn't answer because I'd forgotten completely about that until right this second. Um, good timing there. Uh, do for, for all, I mean, first off, feel free to write me again. This time I, I'm, I'm no longer moving out of an office, so this time I will catch my emails. Um, Happy is absolutely always looking for contributors. We actually, we hit a really fun milestone um, less than a month ago where we merged in the hundredth contributors code. So we've had a hundred people contribute some code to the, uh, to the main Happy Fire library, which I think is kind of neat actually. Um, 
that community has really taken off over the last few years. Um, in terms of, of how to get involved, I mean, the, the, the lowest touch version, of course, is we, we do welcome pull requests that come out of nowhere, and it happens all the time. Um, if you, you know, if you know of something you want to contribute, whether it's documentation or fixing a bug or implementing a feature or anything, um, submitting a pull request out of nowhere is, is not discouraged. Uh, lots of people do it. We do review them and all of that good stuff. Um, even better though, I mean, if you, <clears throat> you know, if you were to post on our Google group or in the Zulip Happy uh, stream with an idea for something you wanted to work on, I mean, we're always happy to sort of say, um, you know, have you considered X and Y? These are ideas you might want to think about. Um, or for that matter, if, if somebody's already working on that problem, of course, we'll save you the trouble of, uh, of doing something that, that uh, you know, isn't, uh, it, it isn't the best use of your time. So we're always happy to have that kind of conversation. Uh, and as I say, I mean, 100 people have been done this so far. We, we really do welcome it and have tried to sort of create a, a big tent, as it, uh, as it were with Happy Fire. It's, it's a neat little community, I think, that, that has been built up around, uh, around the software. Thank you, uh, James. And here's another question from <laughs> Matthew, um, asking about the graph operation code that Graham talked about yesterday. And Graham promised to submit a pull request for the graph operation. So now, can you repeatedly bug him about it until he does? And I think Graham's here, so Matthew, <laughs> you can do it directly. <laughs> oh, look, I'm really sorry, but I haven't done the pull request yet. And not this morning? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Um, but okay. Um, but you can bug me yourself on Julep. You don't have to ask James to bug me. I'm also okay. willing to bug okay. Graham, though. It's pretty fun. <laughs> All right, I'll I'll uh, I'll do that. I'll make that my Thursday thing. He especially appreciates lots of Jira issues. So if you just file a bunch of those, Graham really loves that. So. Uh, hi, James. I have a question. Hello. Uh, hi. Uh, this is um, regarding the extensions. I mean, I'm working on the fire validator for DSTU3 and re recently upgraded to Happy Fire 4.2.0. So I'm using like a US core profiles, like with a version of like a 1.0.1. .1. So the problem I'm having is, uh, especially for the patient resource, it has like a race and ethnicity, birth sex. And I added um, a profiles and value sets, code systems, I mean, whatever is needed to the server. But looks like that is using like the jars, what is added, what are there in the class path? I am not seeing, okay, the validation against the uh, structures okay, I am defining. So uh, I am lost actually yeah, how to do that one. That would be great okay, if I can get any feedback from you. Absolutely. Um, so to start with, are you using Happy Fire JPA? Are you using the JPA server or no, is this no. just standalone validation? Yeah, yeah. just a standalone okay. validation. Cool. So, I mean, the first thing I'll say there, if at all possible, I mean, it's fine if not possible, but if you can, I would highly recommend upgrading to Happy Fire 5. Um, the reason I recommend that, uh, I mean, there's a couple of reasons, you know, first off, it's just newer, so there'll be fewer bugs in it, of course. At least we hope there'll be fewer bugs in it. Uh, more importantly, uh, we actually rewrote all of the infrastructure that, that powers how conformance resources get into the validator in Happy Fire 5. So a lot of this stuff um, has changed for the better, actually. It's a lot simpler to, uh, to construct. Um, I'll give you an explanation of how to solve this problem. And don't worry, all of what I'm about to say does apply mm -hmm. to Happy Fire 4 as well. But mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, if you can get yourself onto five, I'll start there. Um, the, the way that all of this works, so out of the box, uh, the validator is going to use the built-in fire, what it, what it calls, what does it call it? The validation structures jar. Uh, and the validation structures jar, you could, you could think of it as, as sort of all the core artifacts. So the core definitions for fire, the core it does include any of the core extensions that are in the core spec, so all of that stuff, but it does not include any of the US core stuff, um, okay. only stuff that's in the base specification. What you're gonna wanna do in order to load in um, 
in order to load in the US core implementation guide. And this is a bit of a pain, but it's unfortunately how it works, especially in Happy Fire 4, is you're gonna create, you're gonna create an instance of this thing called the, um, what's it called? The pre-populated, uh, you know what? I'm gonna try and guess oh, the name, but I'm, the... Gonna, I'm just looking it up because I can never remember the name myself. <laughs> For the pre-populated validation support? That's the one, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm using that one. Okay. I have like a default to profile validation support, then okay. pre-populated, and the pre-populated, okay, I'm setting up okay, all the uh, structure definitions, profiles, I mean, value sets, code systems. Unless I have like a meta tag in my resource, then only right. it does look for the custom structure definition is this is the right the correct assumption right okay so this is this is the next bit to this so in in happy fire 4 unfortunately the only way you could tell the validator as far as happy's external api goes that you wanted to validate against a specific um a specific profile was to to include it in the profile declaration of the resource. So if you weren't doing that, of course, it's not going to know that it wants to look at any of the any of the extensions or any of the stuff that you're looking at. That has changed in five. Uh, there is now an, an overload of the validate method that allows you to pass in a profile declaration. So you can say, I want you to validate this resource against this specific profile declaration, this specific uh, structure definition URL without it being in in the profile or sorry in the resource being validated itself yeah I, I so that made sense um, to to continue with that one one more thing is like this is the patient resource right I have like a patient profile us core profile but in there it is referring to other structure definitions race and ethnicity in this case okay do I need to add those also you do absolutely um, so those things will need to get you basically in your and th this is kind of the annoyance of, of doing this stuff in your pre populated validation support, you need to individually load all of the contents that are relevant to, to validation. So you'll need to load all of the structure definitions, including the core, the, the patient one, the extensions, mm -hmm. you'll want to load the value sets that it references the code systems that are a part of that IG. It's all a bit of a pain, but you have to load all of that. Um, I will say one of the things coming in Happy Fire 5.1 finally is support mm -hmm. for Fire packages. Um, and this makes it a whole lot better. Uh, this code is actually already merged. So if we haven't, we're not gonna release until August, but uh, the current sort of snapshot builds of, of Happy 5.1 do include this feature. With package management, this gets a whole lot easier because of course, it, once you've got package management in, all you need to do is say, I'm looking for whatever it is, org.hl7.uv.core, I think I forgot, mm -hmm. I always forget what the exact package name is for that. But you give it that package name, you give it the version that you're interested in, it will go and actually talk to packages.fire.org, download it locally, and then use it. Um, so the whole process of doing validation against, uh, against implementation guides as of Happy Fire 5.1 is going to be just so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Unfortunately, oh. I followed everything, but somehow it is not working still. Okay, it is giving complaints for ethnicity areas. Somehow it is not recognizing that. Oh, interesting. Uh, so you do have all of the extensions loaded into your pre-populated. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, sounds, I, I guess. Sounds like a support issue. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. So I will. Maybe, I think, um, Okay, go ahead, James. I, the, I guess the one thing I would say is, I mean, I, I kind of agree. I, I don't want to sort of spend too much time dwelling yeah, on this. I'm the sorry, one thing I'll I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not, yeah. not at all. Yeah. You're, you, I, I bet you if you're having this problem, there's probably 20 other people listening that have the same problem. It's a common one. So don't worry about that. I will say if you can, do try upgrading to five because we did fix a lot of bugs in the four to five life cycle. If you still mm -hmm. have a problem with five, maybe post in Zulip or on, uh, on our Google group. Okay. Thank you so much, James. Absolutely. Um, James, I have a question here around facades. Um, should Happy create a me new mechanism for a facade that takes care of the fire implementation and developers would just need to write the CRUD operation to their database? Can you talk a little bit about the facades in Happy? Huh. Yeah, I certainly can. I mean, I guess depending on the nature of the question, that's that's kind of the way I see our current facade design working. Um, 
naturally you've got to create um, annotated methods where you're saying I'm implementing a, a read or a search or whatever. Uh, there's a bit of boilerplate in there, but of course, if you don't like boilerplate, you're probably not meant to be doing Java in the first place. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I've seen, one of the things I've seen people work on is the ability, and actually I know that this is a thing these days, you can design, use Java interfaces to put all of your annotations there, and then your CRUD methods just become implementations of those interfaces. Uh, that was that was a community contribution that got merged in for Happy Fire 5. It used to be that your annotations couldn't live in interfaces. I think that gets a little bit closer to the ideal of all you're touching is business logic and no boilerplate for what it's worth. Okay, I have another question here. Um, <clears throat> someone wants to know what, <clears throat> what the roadmap for Happy over the next six to 12 months looks like or maybe you can point him or her to uh, a resource that you have online oh fun um so i guess the the biggest thing i would point you to i'll, I'll try and give a sense of the roadmap as best i oh no i actually brought it up so i will uh i'll find it uh the thing that i will point you to that's the the most important bit is we do releases uh quarterly um and our quarters are a bit weird they're in february may august and and november so the next one will be in august we do a release webinar um every time a every time we have a new release of course uh, and those release webinars are up on youtube um and you'll find links to them from the happy website as well and we do try to talk about what we're going to be up to for the next three to six months within uh, those release webinars our roadmap currently does not stretch out farther than six months just because things change so quick that uh, we have no uh, no good way of, of planning but to give you a quick sense of what we uh what i mentioned i just brought up the slides to talk about what's coming uh, in the next while a few of the key features that are coming in the next release of, of Happy. Uh, the first is an operation called Last N, um, which is this really neat operation for building up, um, for doing basically observation searches where you give it a, a bunch of codes and it finds you the last bunch of each of those codes. Uh, we did this with this, in this really neat uh, co collaboration with the NIH, uh, specifically Clem McDonald's group. Um, the whole thing is powered by Elasticsearch. We had some fun talking to the Elasticsearch people about how to get this thing working super performant and it works really well now. Um, that, that programming is done at this point. We're just doing documentation, uh, but that will be in the next release. Uh, we've been working on an EMPI module, uh, which is an implementation of the match, the dollar sign match operation. Um, that is probably the part of Happy I can speak the least to just because I haven't been involved in the implementation at all, but it's super neat stuff. Um, we have planned a bunch of work in, uh, in improving the integration between Happy Fire and the OpenCDS library, the CQL governor, uh, which is for in execution of CQL, the clinical quality language in Happy Fire. So that's a, uh, we haven't, haven't yet figured out exactly when or what that's going to look like, but CD, CQL work is pretty high on our, uh, our roadmap. And the other thing that was mentioned in our last update was around code system versioning. Uh, Happy's terminology service today does not understand the concept of versioned code systems. If you load Link, for example, uh, all you can ever do is search the most recent version of Link. So we have plans to Rada, improve that. Sorry, James. Radharani, can you mute yourself? You're not speaking. Yes, I'm going to. I'm good. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I know my dog is bothering. Yeah, there's a dog. I was wondering what it is, actually. <laughs> oh, I recognized it instantly. Mine does the same. Uh, oddly enough, that was the end of... Uh, okay, of sorry. Of the yeah, so, stuff, so good timing. I have a question here about um, using a facade on an API instead of a regular data source. Can you talk about that? Is that at all possible? And, and how does it perform or any disadvantages? 100% possible and very common. Um, I will say the spot where I'm seeing a lot of action with facades again against APIs, and this this I wouldn't be surprised if this is why you're asking, uh, is around the new ONC rules. Uh, a very common scenario, at least from what I've seen, is people are, are looking at these new ONC rules. They're realizing that we've built up all these great microservices or enterprise services, or in some cases, even like soap based old sort of legacy services that have all the data but don't have it in a nice format uh, this is this is like a super common problem these days um, and putting a facade in front of that is a lovely architecture just because you're not you're of course not rewriting all of the all of the old 
like all, all of the, the data access stuff. You don't have to start re reinvent your database queries and all of that. All you need to do is write this thin layer where happy takes care of the, um, I don't know, happy takes care of the fire API itself. You take care of sort of mapping between your, your existing service and what the fire model looks like. And that all works. Um, performance wise, that tends to work really well. Uh, the only sort of challenge there, and this this is going to happen anytime you are putting a facade in front of anything, really. It's not specific to APIs, but you're always going to be bound by how the original API or the original database, if you're doing a facade against a database for that matter, how it how it's like where its performance lies. You know, the the fire, uh, the blue button APIs, for example, the patient access APIs, they mandate a set of search parameters and a set of patterns for searching. Uh, and of course, if your your underlying API only allows me to search for, I don't know, explanation of benefits using these three identifiers and the patient's address and date of birth as, as query parameters, um, I mean, that, that that is just not how the Fire API works. So you've got a bit of an impedance mismatch there. That's the type of challenge people tend to run into. Um, and solving that often is a, a, a tedious nightmare, to, to put it bluntly. Um, but I, I mean, that that problem aside, performance doesn't tend to be a big concern there. Uh, and certainly, I, you know, I, I say that's a big problem. It, it is, it's never been a, a showstopper. Um, it, we're seeing lots of people sort of successfully solving that type of problem. Okay, thank you, James. Um, Matthew again with a question with the new partitioning feature in Happy Fire 5 is it possible for resources in one partition to reference re resources in another partition and if so is search chaining supported? All right I will start by saying I am so excited you're asking that question because um, the short answer is yes absolutely it is. Um, partitioning we tried really hard to make it a super flexible um, sort of mechanism. Partitioning, for anyone who's not aware of this, uh, is the mechanism you could use to build multi-tenancy, um, which was just added in, in Happy Fire 5. Um, it, it allows for sort of, I don't know, what I call strict multi-tenancy, which is, is just, you know, one, one client's data does not have anything to do with another client's data. They, they can't see each other's data. They're, they, you know, they have nothing to do with each other. That's pretty traditional stuff for multi-tenancy. Um, but you do have the ability to do um, what I'm sort of making up a term for, which is mixed multi-tenancy. Uh, the idea there being that you, you can, an individual user might only have access to one partition or two partitions or uh, N partitions, but at create time, it's possible to create links between specific partitions. Uh, all of that is possible. There is a setting, uh, when you turn on partitioning, there's this new sort of bean that sits inside uh, the JPA server called partition settings. Uh, it's kind of a companion to the old DAO config that had all the settings originally. Uh, it's got a number of items, and by default, there's one that you're going to end up using, which is just partitioning enabled, true, false. But there is absolutely a setting in there that is, it's, it's actually, its name I think is pretty intuitive, and I'm forgetting exactly, but it's something like allow references to cross partition boundaries, um, and, and it's like a Boolean as well. If you turn that on, then yes, you can, uh, you can absolutely create references that cross those partition boundaries. And I see that as being a common scenario for fire servers. I don't, I don't have any experience with it yet. I haven't seen anyone do it, but I feel like it's, it's likely to become a common thing where you've got maybe your conformance resources and your subscriptions and that type of thing belong in an administrative partition that only exists once, but then your, your various partitions of clinical data go into separate partitions and maybe reference into the, into the administrative one. I, I could see that being a useful pattern. Uh, as I say, I haven't seen anyone do it, but it feels like something that probably will happen. Is, um, is, is there any internal data structure to control? So if somebody has access to multiple partitions, um, how do you control that? Yep, so the, the answer to literally everything happy these days is with an interceptor. Uh, and this is no exception to that. The whole way that partitioning works is uh, we've added two new, we call them point cuts in our interceptor framework. These are basically just spots in the request pipeline where you can inject logic. Um, when you have partitioning enabled, when data is being created or when it's being read, uh, there's a partition for create, a partition, or sorry, a point cut for create and a point cut for read. Um, you basically just have to in implement your own interceptor that decides, you know, based on whatever it is, like it might be based on the URL that came in, it might be based on 
a user's access token or some intrinsic property of the user. Like how you decide, make your decisions is up to you, but you're gonna decide, okay, this user has create access to these two partitions and maybe they have read access to this one or these five or, or all partitions or whatever it is. Um, incidentally, that what, what I just said applies to create. So you can, you can create sort of resources that do cross boundaries. This also applies to read back. So you might decide that the user only has access to one one partition and when they do searches they should only see that one partition you could also decide that a user has access to all partitions and then they when they do searches they're just getting all the data on the server so i mean a lot of this is going to be very much up to uh up to what's useful to you and i will say that as i say this is a brand new feature we have no idea how people are going to use it so i'm i'm, I'm always excited to hear a question like that because it means people are starting to figure out what this feature is useful for <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, we, well, we had a need for it before the feature and already put together an interceptor that, that did that at a different, but now having these, I have to try test out these new interception points and, and see, but um, yes, very helpful. Cool. Hey, um, profiles and extensions, how can you, add profiles and extensions to a happy server and is there a way to generate code classes java classes for these uh extensions james <laughs> so it's two that's two questions right how to get them in and how can you generate code let's let's start with the hard one which is how do you uh how do you how do you uh generate code with them this has literally been the the perennial question um i i I feel like, so way back, I'll, I'll take you back for a second, way back in the DST1 days um, in Happy Fire, we had a solution that did exactly that. Back then, structure definitions were called profile resources, and we wrote a little module that would take a profile resource and generate, a, and generate some code. And it worked pretty well, actually. Um, of course, the resource got renamed um, and that code broke, and I thought a little bit about updating it, and then profiles got super complicated um, and I, I, I've sort of, we've never really gone back on it just because there's a lot of, there's some really interesting things there. I mean, concepts like slicing, which uh, if I'm honest, I, I only half, half understand myself. You can go really crazy with slicing. How do you represent that in Java code for a model? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. So this is where it's been left is that we, I mean, Graham and I have this discussion every six months and it comes up on the mailing list a lot and at every dev days. Um, Somebody asks about exactly this question, so certainly you're not. Uh, don't worry, you're not in. Uh, you're not alone in wondering about that. But I will say, as of now, there is no way to generate Java code based on a structure definition. We have a very strong desire to get there, but there's there's some pretty significant challenges, I think, uh, along the way before we would uh, we would have something like that. Um, James, if I can comment please. on this, uh, there's other challenges beyond uh, what James talked about around how you understand and conceptualize the code that you're generating, how you namespace it, um, how it relates to the rest of the framework. Um, and in fact, why, what you're trying to achieve uh, by generating the profiles. Um, and, and some of those things are things that we've never nailed down. And I've, I've got, I've half written a generator framework. It doesn't deal with uh, discriminators yet. It's one of my big to-dos, but it also just raised all those questions for me. So perhaps we should start a thread somewhere in a happy, maybe happy on Julep to talk about why you would generate code like that, what you're trying to achieve and, and you know, nut out some of those design decisions and, and maybe it'll bubble up to top of, you know, so far enough up in my priorities to get to it. Uh, if I can jump in too for a second, uh, I'm waiting on an approval for the uh, new projects to be made public, but uh, I have a code generator framework that I've been working on for about six months uh, with the goal of doing open API, TypeScript, JavaScript, whatever it is. The language modules are about 500 lines of code so far. Uh, every time I want to add a new language for output, uh, it reads in the structure depths, it does discriminators, it does codes. I haven't done code systems and value sets yet, um, but I've been playing with that too. And it is quite more of a mess than uh, you would think. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gino, do we have a scoop here? Uh -huh. 
Oh, well, I've actually been talking with AWOT about it because we're thinking about plugging it in to generate and to replace the T4 models in the uh, core of the Firely stuff with it because he's sick of the T4 stuff. So uh, <laughs> okay. I have an old project that's online and that one is on GitHub, uh, but it was started from reading the uh, Excel spreadsheets actually and uh, generating the output from there. Uh, and so it only supports the current version build and there's a lot of mess. So the new one supports uh, three, four and five already and has all that stuff uh, integrated, so. Interesting, thank you. Sounds yeah. super cool. I have another one, um, a difficult one, a facade on federated multiple fire servers. Is it possible, <laughs> is it done? Is it, have you seen it, James? Oh, this is fun. So, yeah, this this came up oddly enough yesterday during uh, during yesterday's intro session, uh, and I this may even be the same answer because I I said uh, I said come back tomorrow and let's talk about that a bit a bit during office hours. Um, so first off, yes, I have absolutely seen this. Um, the discussion we got into yesterday a little bit is, and hopefully this is this is sort of going in the right direction for where this question is. Um, these days, of course, anyone who's building web services in general, well independent of fire, you know, everybody wants to do microservices. That is the hot buzzword of the 2010s or the 2020s. Oh, oh God, I don't even know what decade it is anymore. Um, everyone wants to build microservices. And of course, um, you know, you, you sort of, there's a weird mismatch there with fire itself, just because fire, fire's API works best if you sort of treat it almost as a monolith. All of the features like chaining across resources and includes and reverse includes and all of that stuff, they do kind of assume that the encounter resource is coming from the same place as the patient resource and vice versa. Um, so sort of breaking up in your individual resources into microservices, it, it in a way just goes against this concept. I apologize, there's a train going by. I'm gonna close my door. Oh, that's way too noisy. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I've, I've sort of been chatting with people about, I don't know that I've seen anyone do this yet, but a few people are starting to, to go down this path and I think they're gonna be successful, is coming up with an architecture where you've got your encounter is being served up by your encounter service, your patients being served up by your patient service, your observations by the observation service, blah, blah, blah. And then another fire server, which is basically a facade for your facades and it's going to handle sort of routing decisions. It's going to say, okay, we're doing a patient query and we're doing an include on, um, on, on, on I don't know, reverse include on encounters, for example. So I'm going to go talk to those two microservices that sit beneath me and then I'm going to aggregate the results into a single response that I'll bring back. Um, that is a pattern that absolutely people are starting to get into. And from what I'm hearing, it's looking quite positive. I cannot, po I can't point to anyone who's got that to production yet that I know of, but I think it's a matter of time for sure. And I, it seems like a neat architecture, actually. I, I can see the appeal to it for sure. Um, James, um, the other question that people commonly ask is I've got multiple servers serving up uh, multiple, you know, in observations in particular. Um, and I want a single server that fronts for those multiple servers uh, so that users see them as a single system. And there's a bunch of identification challenges that you really need some governor in the middle to sort out. Um, so that's the other aspect of what this question could be about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, I mean, on that, I've actually, you know, I have, I have seen people build facades there. And I mean, as Graham rightly points out, there are big identification issues there that people run into. For what it's worth, the tiny little tip that I've seen a few, few people use, um, you know, the, the simplest thing, of course, is I'm doing a, a read on resource observation slash one, two, three. Where do I go and get it? Uh, because, of course, all I've got in hand is the, the type and that number one, two, three, and there's no indication of, of which of my various little backing servers have it. I have seen people do this with a scheme where they just do some sort of prepending or appending or whatever to the to the uh, the IDs. Of course, in fire identifiers, you're allowed to have up to 64 characters and they can be alphanumeric and they allow dashes uh, or dots. No, they don't allow dashes. They allow dots. I think that's it. Um, so, you know, if you, if you basically, you say that all my identifiers from system A are gonna start with A and then they'll have that number, you've sort of got routing sort of hidden into your, uh, into your, your ID scheme. I've seen people do that quite successfully before. It feels hackish, but in, in all honesty, I don't think it is. I think it's uh, a pretty good solution. <laughs> so Michael, does this answer your question? This was Michael Lawley's question. 
Um, it, it does partially. I guess I was thinking of use cases where you may not have control over the, the servers that you're um, building the facade for. You know, if you're a patient with data spread across multiple places um, or you're federating terminology servers, um, I'm close to my heart. Great. Yeah, I, I mean, the, I love the use case of you're a patient with a bunch of sources of data. Like, I feel like at some point, Fire is going to turn into what the web is. You know, we've today we've got all these, you know, we've, our silos are a whole lot better than they used to be, but we've still got a bunch of Fire servers. You know, every hospital's got their own Fire server, and it is it is still a bit of a silo, although the data is much more unlocked than it used to be. I do really hope that at some point we'll get to a point where, you know, we really are sort of crossing those boundaries and writing apps that don't really care that, you know, this bit of data lives in this server and this other bit of data lives in this other server, much like broader interpro internet protocols tend to be. I mean, the way that we think about email or anything like that, like we don't care where the servers live and where the data physically lives. Um, I, I love the, the thought of, of that aggregation happening. Um, I, I, I kind of wonder, I don't really have anything more than a rambly bunch of thoughts about that. It, like, is a facade the solution? Are smarter clients a solution there? Maybe both? I don't know. I, Graham feel, looks like he wants to say something about that too. <laughs> no, he does not. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> and maybe it's a description to bring everything into one place. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, that too, like subscription, I, I feel like subscription is going to change the world when everybody realizes how powerful it is. And I mean, clearly, it's about to get a whole bunch more powerful still. So that's, I've, I've said for years now, subscription is like the hidden gem in fire that uh, anyone who has discovered it, like has, has done amazing things with it, but not everybody has discovered it yet. Someone's smiling. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll, ad I'll admit that our... Um entire ecosystem strategy and uh and we're uh, just a little background i'm from resmed um and we have um, a number of subsidiaries uh with dozens of applications um, that provide uh, clinical services for patients as well as patient engagement applications um and the uh, moving towards a native fire repository, native fire ecosystem, um, the subscription model is absolutely paramount to driving the, the complex workflows, um, being able, uh, allowing different parts of the organization to build different tool sets that tap right in to a centralized repository of information. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to second that particular comment because I've been pushing that for a long time uh, about the power of the subscription model. So um, that's got to continue to evolve and um, it can, you know, it, it, it be one of the things you have to focus on from an efficiency perspective, I think. Right. I just verified this is being recorded right now. <laughs> yeah, it is. Perfect. <laughs> So thank you, Matthew. Um, I have another question. How do models and identifiers work when creating a resource, James? Models and identifiers. Huh. I have to be honest. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, Faroon, can you speak up and explain or collaborate or um, elaborate on your question? Yeah, so I was looking at the slides from yesterday and it was in encoding a resource, uh, there was there's one of the slides started talking about um, models and identifiers. Um, all right, uh, I'm just bringing the slides up. So, um, I've, I've, I guess I did find. Uh, what I think was, why don't I'm going to share my screen for one second, just to make sure we're on the same page here. Uh, this is probably the slide. This is yesterday's slides I've got up here on the uh, on the screen, and I'm sure I'm assuming we're talking about the right one. I know it's probably a little small, so we can make that bigger. Um, in general, um, actually, we don't even. We're not even showing popular. Oh, we are showing up populating an identifier. I mean, the general deal here. Hopefully, I'm getting at at 
the heart of your question. And I'm assuming you're probably relatively new to fire. One of the most tricky things in fire, and I feel like everybody misses this, and it's, it's easy to see why, because the names are a bit confusing. Resources have both an ID um, and an identifier often. Not every resource has an identifier, but all the important ones tend to. And these are very different concepts. You can think about your ID as being your database primary key. Um, it is a, a, a string of 64 characters. There's a bit of limitation in terms of which characters there are, but there's not much else there. And effectively, it's the last part of the URL when someone's trying to read that, that resource back. Most importantly, um, if a fire server is optimal, like if you're, if you're doing all the right things, that ID never changes. It's sort of a permanent home for that resource. It's an ID that you can use to look that thing up for the rest of time. Identifiers, on the other hand, are most commonly for things like business identifiers. So your insurance numbers, your health card numbers, if that's a thing for you, um, driver's license, passport numbers, um, I don't know, order numbers if we're talking about stuff other than patients. Um, and these numbers often are, I mean, you know, I've seen lab systems that recycle their order numbers once a year. So they're certainly far from unique. Um, there's all kinds of crazy things there. Um, they are a separate concept from that resource ID uh, in that there's many of them, they work differently. Um, and I have no idea if this is going in a direction that's useful to you, but this is, this is an area that trips people up. Uh, the reason I bring it all up is to say that when you're dealing with the models, you're going to call set ID to set that first concept in the resource. Um, and then you're going to say add identifier for every one of the identifiers you want to add. I'm not showing the set ID in this example, but it is something you would typically do if you were uh, building up a patient resource. Does that uh, help at all? Uh, so the identifier just it's something that the resource can be accessed with later? Yeah, I mean, the idea is the ID, um, the ID is what you would do if you're doing a read. So if I'm doing a get on patient slash one, two, three, really what I'm doing there is I'm asking for the server, give me back the one resource that has the ID of one, two, three. On the other hand, um, identifiers are generally floated by, or generally found by means of the, of the fire search operation which is to say, I can usually do a search for, for example, patient question mark identifier uh, equals, and then I'm going to put whatever my identifier is. Um, and I might get back a bundle with zero matches if nobody had that identifier. But it, it's conceivable I might get back 100 patients if there were 100 resources that all had that same value for an identifier. Um, so they have, they have sort of different properties in that way. Okay. See in the two minute warning. So if anyone has a, uh, a burning question, act now or you're gonna have to come to the virtual pub and ask it there and you might get booed out of the room. <laughs> uh, this is Santosh. I have a follow up question to the ID and identifier part. So now if I'm moving data across two servers, right? Probably from like the STO2 to STO3, I would want that ID to remain the same and if I'm writing a script for like not tra trans, trans uh, moving the data across, so should I be using create or update? Because like in create, sometimes I, I saw an exception where like, you no, know, you cannot specify an ID. Yes. Um, so I, I guess I'll say quickly, because we're about to run out of time. Uh, if you don't get everything you want out of this, by all means, bring it to Zulip or the Google group. This, it's a fun topic and we could talk all day about it. Um, the thing that you ran into is most certain, almost certainly that you were um, in fire, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, but it is a good design. It goes well with the way REST is supposed to work. If you want your client to assign an ID, so you want to control the ID of the resource that's being created, you actually don't use a post, which is a fire create, you use a put, which kind of counterintuitively is actually a fire update. But you're using an update on an ID that doesn't already exist in the server, and the server will turn around and internally it creates the resource with the ID that you've specified. So you do an update where you assign the ID that you want. One additional gotcha that may well be where, uh, where you know, what you ran into, and thank you, Brian, I know we're out of time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up very quickly. Um, <laughs> 
Oh, good. Okay, so oh, he says I'm good. Awesome. Uh, so the uh, the one thing that uh, the one thing that may have tripped you up, Happy out of the box is configured in a way that it does not allow a client to assign a purely numeric identi identity for a resource. So you can't say, I want to create a resource with ID patient one two three because one, two, three is all numbers, Happy will block that by default because it reserves numeric IDs for its own use. It, it, it keeps a pool for when it's assigning IDs and it, it will use those uh, out of the box. There is a configuration option on the DAO config, um, which allows you to, to turn that, that behavior off. So, and this, this may well be what you're looking for. If you want to be able to create a resource with, observate, with the ID patient123, you can do it. You just have to configure Happy to allow client assigned numeric IDs. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And with that, I think we're going to end this session. Thanking you for doing this office hours and thanking the audience for contributing and asking questions. And hopefully we, we'll see you all in the in the pop crawl. Absolutely. See you guys soon. And thank you all. This has been super fun. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Reen. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Reen. Okay. Goodbye, all. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>